What's up guys, I'm Charlie. I'm Nick. And welcome back for episode 25 of the Goliath Gamecast. For the first time in video, you can see the video form of this podcast up on the Facebook page. And as always, you can download the podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. Nick, welcome to the game room. We're in a we're in a new location for this yeah. episode. Trying this, this, this is this is Charlie's basement, and what you see behind me is just one of many walls of games. Um, this is like this is my first time being here, and I was just kind of just blown away. It's yeah. just a really like. It's like a nostalgia room. He's got like every system. Um, like what made you start collecting all these? Well, I always tell the story of like I pulled out my old Nintendo from my attic and then my dad and I started playing like Duck Hunt and Super Mario Bros. I had like 10 games at the time. Then I started kind of looking for games that I wanted and I didn't yeah. have as a kid. Then I started buying the games that I had as a kid but had sold off because like Pretty much every kid, I had to sell off my system to, to pay for the new Get one, some right? Get new stuff, yeah. Yeah, so yep. that's kind of how it started, and it kind of snowballed from there. And then I started going to garage sales and buying games there, buying um, lots of games that people were selling off on, like, uh, Craigslist, Kijiji here in Canada. Yeah. I'd buy the whole lot and keep what I need and then flip off the rest to pay for more video games. So it kind of snowballed through that uh, initial NES pulling it out of my attic. Yeah. And now yeah. I'm at like, I think 5,500 games down yeah. here. Well, what what he won't tell you is that actually all these cases are empty. There's no That's games. Right. Yeah, yeah. He just collects the cases. I, yeah. printed, yeah. Out, I printed out all the uh, the covers on uh, at Kinko's. And... Yeah. Um, what, what games do you find are like kind of the hardest? To, like, or like, you know, maybe like, I guess, system that are it's really hard to find games for. Um, Sega Saturn. Okay, um, yeah. Actually, a lot of the Sega systems, so Sega CD, Sega Saturn, Sega Dreamcast, uh, that's just stuff you don't see in the wild. If you, if you want right. to start collecting that stuff, you're looking at um, trades or eBay or picking them up at conventions and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, it's a little rare, like... The stuff we have behind us, like original Xbox, yeah. 360, PS2, like this stuff's a little super easy easier to find because it was just so mass produced, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Wii stuff. Um, yeah. PlayStation 1 is actually getting surprisingly a little bit harder to find. Yeah. I used to find a ton of that stuff. Well, but... I was asking you before, like if you had any of those, you know, the long cases, right? Yeah. Of, like, and I think you said there's They're down some, there somewhere yeah. right behind you there. You know, I remember, yeah, back before box. they had the jewel cases, they had like those old. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're hard. To, yeah, nobody knows how to display those because the boxes They're are longer. So awkward. They're yeah. longer than a standard DVD. Oh, right. So oh, it's a yeah. little bit awkward. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's uh, kind of how I got my start. And uh, we decided that uh, we're going to be doing some filming here today. So we thought we would shoot the uh, Goliath Gamecast. Down yeah, here, so. I mean, like at the Goliath offices, we don't really have a good place to, to film. shoot. And we figured, well, it's like, Charlie, like you have like the perfect location. Yeah. Like we should really just try and do a filming day at home. So we'll see how this angle works maybe for next episode we'll switch it up and i'll give you guys a different shot of different the, backdrop maybe of with the some game nintendo room. stuff jumping into today's first topic uh super mario odyssey yeah so um, last podcast we had just actually received that really cool package yeah I, th I think it was like i was just going out that day to like uh buy it buy my copy so not, neither of us had played much of it yet like we demoed it at e3 but i mean it had been months since we actually played it. So now we, I think we've both had extensive time with it, both um, beaten Bowser, going back, collecting all the power moons. Um, yeah, try not to spoil too much. I mean, there's, I guess, I mean, that's not a spoiler, but I'm no, saying no, the but part no. after that yeah. you unlock yeah. might be a spoiler. Right, kind right. Of. Okay, yeah, we won't go into that. You guys can check out my full review on uh, Goliath.com. Yeah, so. and you gave this, I think this was our first perfect 10. I had to. I was like, I was sitting there as I was writing the review for Super Mario Odyssey, trying to think of a negative and any negative that I could come up with were like very, just the very minor, minor gripes. Minor yeah. gripes. And none of, like, a lot of them were things that I had just been kind of hearing other people gripe about that I necessarily didn't have a problem with. One of those was like, we talked about the um, consistency with like art design and within, within yeah, the game. Yeah, because you can have... Um you know, a location like New Donk City yeah. where it's like, oh, this is weird. There's all these like, you know, humans around and that. And then it later on you're in like the food kingdom. It's kind of a lot of like flat textures. Yeah. There's a, the lunch like a, kingdom, like a it? very, yeah. Lunch and kingdom. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then there's like a, a realistic looking dragon like later on that kind of looks like it was 
ripped out of like a game like Skyrim. Yeah. And some people are kind of like, I don't know, like this isn't very consistent. But I like, took that I, as a positive. I yeah, actually I, enjoyed how crazy the level design and world and uh, kingdom design was. That's what I like. Like you, I mean, part of the fun of this game, like when you're first going through, is just being like, I want to get to the next kingdom and see like what crazy ideas they've come up with next. That's how it was for um, me, yeah. <laughs> some of them are kind of conventional, I think. Like you have like kind of your... Your snow kingdom, yeah. your, uh, like there was like the beach one, whatever. Yeah, watery kingdom. Yeah, yeah. but I, I still like enjoyed those. Like it felt kind of, uh, it made the the crazy ones, I think, a little more special. Yeah. What do you think about the gameplay? I, I think it's great. Like, I, yeah, that kind of ties in, I guess, to like maybe the, my quibble is that I wish Mario kind of had like a punch attack. Yeah, that was a little strange not yeah, having that. Yeah, because it... Because your main kind of like offensive capability in the game is using your cap, right? To, but if you're using that against enemies that you can capture or possess or whatever, you're not actually attacking them. You're just taking them over. Like what would happen a lot is like if I had like a group of Goombas and I'm like, okay, I don't need to actually capture them anymore. They just become kind of annoying because you have to actually jump on them to get rid of That's them. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so it'd be nice to have kind of just an attack. You can get them from the side, like maybe just a punch or something. I mean, but, I, I agree, but I like I have to hand yeah. it to Nintendo. Like, for a 30-year-old franchise, to be able to come up with new gameplay mechanics is pretty amazing, right? Like, it's, yeah. it was it was fresh. It was a lot of stuff that we hadn't been uh, seen before or done before in previous yeah. games. So, like, hats off to them for yeah. the level design, the character design, uh, you know, gameplay in general was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and this feels like um, like the f first Mario game, or at least, like, of the 3D ones, where I really feel compelled to keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as much as I like the Galaxy games, I got, like, a little burnt out on them. Yeah. Like, I don't think I finished either of them. Just, I mean, it didn't help that it was kind of on the Wii, and I didn't really want to do the you know, Wii mode, nunchuck, control scheme for very long. I always, it was a deterrent because I always had to blow off the yeah. layer of dust on my Wii before I played with it, so. Actually, okay, <laughs> speaking of control, how did, how did you play so, um, this game? Yeah, mostly? I tried all different configurations, okay. and I think that the best configuration is the one that Nintendo is clearly pushing on you, is the, the dual Joy-Con. It actually right. works quite well, uh, mainly because you don't have to waggle if you don't want to, but yeah. It's there, and when you do, it's usually just like a quick one of these. It's okay. not like you have to stand up and do all this crazy stuff. It's just a quick uh, tap or um, one of these type things. So um, it's comfortable because you can actually sit with the two Joy-Cons, one in each hand, and you're just kind of sitting there on the couch, and when you need to, you can yep. pull that move off. So it actually controls really well, and that's kind of how they had us play it at E3. Yeah, they've kind of been really pushing, pushing that. It. They're like, even the... There's even a screen before you start the game. That's yes, like, that's... You, this is our preferred <laughs> control. You can use these other garbage <laughs> control skips. Skip, 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 but... skip, 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 yeah. skip. Yeah. <laughs> like, how do you let it... It makes you watch it. You can't actually skip it. It holds no. it up there for like 30 seconds. Yeah. So they really want you to use that control configuration. Um, yeah, confession. I never... I haven't used this control configuration yet. I've used the Pro Controller yeah. pretty much the entire time. Yeah, I get it. Um, you know, you, you could probably get comfortable with it. And... Yeah, that was the thing. I Now I feel like I'm too deep into it to want to switch to that. But I do still want to try the the yeah. Joy, or Joy Con configuration. I wanted to try every configuration for the review just so I could kind of speak about which I sure. thought were best. So I tried the Pro. Yeah. I played it on the TV, which it actually looked really good on the TV. Sometimes I have issues with, like, I feel like the game will look better on the portable, smaller, more compact screen, and then yeah. not so good on the TV. But I thought it looked great. I think, yeah, I think it looks great on TV. I played, like, probably like 90% of it on the TV. Oh, you did? Okay. Thought, yeah. Um, mostly because, like, I guess in, in handheld mode, like, it doesn't it doesn't work as well because of that whole motion control thing. Yeah. Like, I know you could take the Joy-Cons... And well, I'd set it up, but I'm like, if I have a TV right here, I might as well. I played 90% in handheld mode. Oh, okay. Um, wow. Much and different I, experience. I never found that, like, the, the motion controls that they're trying to push on you are never 100% necessary. They, I mean, they're, no. they're helpful um, for you to get through situations, but um, I never felt like I needed to use it. And if I did, I had this system, and again, I would just go like this with the system, and... It seemed Usually, to work if yeah. I wanted to use it. So yeah, uh, it wasn't that bad. I in portable mode, um, I thought it's definitely harder to control in portable mode. I think than I the think so. pro yeah. controller. Yeah, mainly because um, you've got the bumpers are a little hard to kind of hold your properly, whereas the controller it's all right yeah. there. So yeah, um, I think it's good like for the in hand handheld mode if you're just kind of 
going through levels, playing it a little more casually, just exploring. Good point. But if you're really looking to get like a yes. difficult power moon or something like that, like yes. you want to be you're set right. up in the best way possible. Some of those yeah. get tough, and some of those I definitely need to. Play I had on one where I actually had to quit. Yeah, I yeah. have to. Yeah. Um, it was like a two D section, and I'm like, this is really difficult yeah yeah i just kept dying and like i was like okay i'm wasting too much time going after this one moon let's go get 10 more in yeah. the time that i could be I, and i'll come back to it right like this is um it's, it's not a hard game to get to like the end credits or whatever but to collect everything like it's gonna be a challenge i think yeah and i'm only like 280 something moons deep like i still have hundreds to collect like yeah. it's it's, it's staggering it's how gonna much have some legs for sure yeah. Yeah. And it's the kind of thing that you can kind of pick up and play for a half hour and put down, go get a few moons. It's really good, like, uh, portable-wise, because I, I always say this, but I use my Switch 90% of the time in portable mode. So, yeah. uh, for me, just to be in bed and be like, ah, I think I'll go get a couple moons, it's kind of fun. Yeah. And shout out to Assist Mode. Um, such a, right. a, a great addition for me. I have two boys, one five and six-year-old. And last night, Andrew was playing uh, Mario Odyssey with Assist Mode on. Um, basically, it Assist Mode adds, I think, some more it adds more health you can't fall off the side or you can fall off the side of the map but there's less penalty uh you can't drown well i guess there's not much penalty to begin with like you only lose really like no. 10 coins or That's something right. each time what'd you think away of that? With lives. i'm okay with it yeah honestly like because then it i feel like i'm kind of more apt to try different things that's true Being like hey Take chances do you think i could jump off of here well whatever it's not like there's much penalty if i You're die right. yeah for sure yeah. um so yeah assist mode was fantastic for my sons it actually has like a directional arrow too so it kind of just guides this is where you need to go next. Oh, okay and he was playing through it i didn't have to help him so yeah. really cool Mar um nintendo kind of added a similar thing with mario kart where they did the i think they called it assist mode there too yeah like a little thing on the back would show up and you it was like bumper cars okay can we talk about that for a second <laughs> yeah. because i i hate how that game's designed where it's on by default i know yeah. every time i have like new people playing it with yeah me, i'm like make sure you turn those off and they're like what what are you talking about yeah. like hit this button hit this button or you'll get five races in and realize yeah. that someone's been using it the whole time yeah yeah they're like i'm so good at this it's like <laughs> actually yeah you're uh, in baby it's because mode. you're in baby mode yeah. yeah yeah it was a weird decision for them to have that yeah i don't know i mean default. that game's like perfect otherwise but i mean yeah it's weird so yeah super mario odyssey i gave it a, t a 10 spoiler go check out my review on goliath.com if you had to apply a score what do you think you would give it oh 10 10 okay yeah definitely like i'm i'm like right there with you i think we're both like this game is like pretty much as close to a masterpiece as you get and where would you rank it in terms of your favorite mario games of all oh, time man i i don't know it's really making a case for being my favorite like i i like the 3d ones a little bit more than the 2d marios i do too you yeah. know as, as good as you know the classics are world yeah. mario brothers 3 i've never been great at them and i feel like there's just a lot more crazy ideas in the 3d ones i've just kind of oh, prefer yeah. playing them now um but like yeah this it might be better than mario 64 which maybe i think it's, it's like blasphemy to some people but like i don't think so i think I it's know. safely better than mario 64 yeah. um to me this the first the greatest mario game of all time is super mario world which has been surpassed so i guess i, I would put odyssey first world uh second i don't know if i would even put 64 third i 64 mm. gets a ton of points for me just because it was so groundbreaking for how yeah innovative it was but and like i mentioned to you that like hilarious. for the first time since that game i played this game with such a sense of joy and like wonderment if that's a word <laughs> probably not yeah but i remember playing super no. mario 64 at toys r us like the little demo kiosk yeah being like whoa super mario 4 in a yeah. 3d world like i had that same feeling with this game it feels like this game came along at exactly the right time because I mean, there's a lot of, even on the same day it came out, you had a game like, um, yes. you know, Wolfenstein 2, where it's like, it's like pretty depressing content and stuff. And it's just like, but here's Mario just as like a, you know what, just sit down, relax and just have like a kind of joyful experience. Absolutely. I mean, we can get into, I, it's already been uh, announced that they sold, I think, 2 million copies of the game in the first week yeah it's like the first couple of days i think it was selling than i think sell it fastest selling mario game ever in the states which is crazy yeah especially when you consider that they're still as as good as the switch is selling this year there still aren't like that many out there in the wild so i think the attach rate was nuts like yeah i don't i don't remember what it was but it's probably like 
like like a third of Switch owners bought it or something. It was, something crazy like that. Like, it, was it was pretty just, insane. Yeah. So the Nintendo Switch is still absolutely killing it. It'll be interesting to see what kind of yeah. numbers we see after Christmas. Yeah, that's that the thing. Mario we haven't even Bundle. had a holiday under their belt yet. Like, that's nuts. I think there was a story, like, <laughs> last week that Nintendo actually had to increase their forecast for, um, like, the year, their yeah. fiscal year or something like that. Like, they're like, oh, we're going to sell more Switches than we thought. Yeah, and like it came out that, uh, I, don't know. I think that they, there's a chance that they might outsell the entire lifetime oh, the Wii U. of the oh, Wii U. Oh, that, that's what it was. Yeah. By by March yeah. of 2018, which it'll have been on the market for a year, Yeah, they expect to have sold more Switches than the Wii U sold in its entire lifetime. It's pretty that's, crazy. Yeah. I mean, also a testament to how poorly the Wii U did, but yeah. also, uh, you know, seeing how well the Switch is doing. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, moving on to the second topic of the day. The Xbox One X was released yesterday. Yeah, so that we, we're filming on Wednesday, so that'd be Tuesday. Yeah, so actually yep. I have my prop right here. Here oh. it is. Here is the Xbox One X. Again with the empty boxes. Yeah. Yep. My uh, Xbox One X is right over there. Yeah, it's set up over there. You can't see it, but... <laughs> Updating all the games to the 4K patches. Right, downloading all your 100 gigabyte yeah. uh, downloads. <laughs> like, yeah, I hope you don't have a bandwidth cap, because... No, woof. I don't. Yeah, yeah, I could imagine. That was a, that was an issue for a lot of people. Um, they did make it pretty easy if you had a portable hard drive. You could actually pre-download all those 4K oh, patches yeah. and, and stuff like that. Them. Yeah, and there was a yeah. way to save my settings. So um, this time when I got the, I have an Xbox One S, so when I upgraded to the Xbox One X, all I had to do was plug in my portable hard drive and it loaded like my profile settings, everything was exactly like my Xbox One S. I just had to download the rest of the games to the internal hard drive, which took Some... almost all night. So. Wow. But yeah, so I picked up the <laughs> Xbox One X um, it's kind of something that I kind of was on the fence about. I pre-ordered it right yeah, away initially. I, I think this is kind of the thing that everyone's kind of running into. It's like, should I buy this? Yeah. Yeah, what, why did you buy it? Okay, so here's my <laughs> justification. <laughs> right. Um, I was very close to, like, after a week after cancelling it because uh, they delayed Cl Crackdown 3, and I was like, okay, well, it's essentially, if you look at it like a new console, what's it launching with? It's only launching with Super Lucky's Tail right now. Yeah. Um, but then I started kind of hearing more about it and um, how powerful it actually is and how good games will run on it. Um, and... Using it as a lead platform was a big thing for me. I was somebody that my lead platform was the uh, Xbox 360, which is one of my favorite consoles of all time. I think right. yours too, right? Uh, it's up there. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I was, I, I know I don't like to refer to myself as an Xbox or PlayStation guy. No. But I definitely love the 360. So um, clearly I had switched over to PS4 this generation yep. um, because I, I, I don't want to start a fanboy war here, but the no. PS4 has better exclusives right now. It just does. Yeah, I mean, and especially out of the gate, it was just kind of clearly the better system. Yeah. I think they're much more on parity now. Yes. Um, I don't think you can go wrong picking either right. one. But, yeah, as you said, I think the PS4 still clearly has the better exclusives. Yeah, and I was also using the PS4 Pro as my lead console for right. playing third, like, what, third-party or cross-platform games. Is yeah, what I'm that, trying makes, to say. that makes sense. So now, that was one of my justifications of picking up the Xbox One X. Let me tell you guys that I am a graphics whore. So uh, that is a yeah. big thing for me. No, I, and you, you have, like, a pretty uh, beefy PC, too. I do. Yeah. So, I mean, most people... That would kill my argument right there, because most people go, well, why do you need that if you have a beefy sure, PC? Sure, sure. But just but, the ease of being able to play stuff on console, and specifically the Xbox, I kind of miss my Xbox. And right. that was a factor. I'm like, I really want to be playing my Xbox. I, I miss the Xbox environment, the controller. I just I just love Xbox. So uh, for me to, as a tool to kind of get back in, that was a factor that, that okay. kind of came into it a little yeah. bit. Uh, but the number one factor was just playing um, cross-platform games and having them run in, you know, some in native 4K, some upscaled and uh, just looking really, really nice. That right. was probably the biggest selling point for me. Yeah, so I think... Um... I mean, I know, yeah, Microsoft, they don't have much in the way of, well, I don't think they have, like, any kind of launch games for the One X, but yeah. they've promised a whole bunch of games that are getting upgrades. Um, I think most of them have them. Well, all their, I mean, all their first-party stuff, obviously, yeah. like uh, Gears of War 4, yeah. Forza 7 um, are going to look, like, amazing on there. Yeah. Um, well, and the interesting thing, too, is that 
they're kind of stressing that like you don't necessarily need a 4k tv no you really don't advantage of it like because i mean there's going to be performance boosts and all that kind of stuff you're still going to see like nicer textures and frame rate is the biggest thing so yeah being able to jump from like a lot of games didn't have like a locked in even 30 like they would dip like 30 25 frames per second yeah to have that now like bumped up to 60 frames a second full 1080p that's a big deal for people who you know don't have a 4k tv now do you think it's gonna be super noticeable to most people it is like like, i mean i know obviously if you're doing a side by side you could tell but like just in general like are you really gonna notice it is enough of a difference to notice okay which is hard to do these days right you know what i mean like because i think that was the problem with the pro is it didn't offer enough of a bump i saw i mean i have a 4k tv so when i went from the regular ps4 to the pro uh you know that's partially the tv being in 4k sure so i i did see a noticeable difference the difference between the xbox one s and one x is definitely noticeable okay 100 frame rate uh yeah. clarity um you can see there's all kinds of videos online that digital foundry always does comparisons that i oh, love yeah. watching yeah. yeah uh there is a noticeable difference but it's not like it's not a difference of going from like the ps2 to ps3 obviously you know what i mean right it's, it's, it's not, not a huge about. hardware leap well and this is i guess a, a new thing we're seeing in uh, the console space is these kind of um like within generation leaps i guess yeah right where they're like okay we don't want to start a whole new console generation um i think we're still gonna see like a a full-fledged like new xbox new ps4 yes but they want to kind of keep the same like ecosystem going they're like okay like you know we're still gonna release the same games across all platforms it's just that you know one of them is gonna is kind of the ferrari of the mix and the other one's just kind of the standard model right yeah essentially they'll have the two platforms and they'll phase out the earlier the, the ones OG. So. yeah i'm stuck with still the original big bulky xbox one but i mean are you, okay so if yeah. you had to upgrade every four years you yeah. sell your previous system um for i don't know at least a third of the cost of the new one yeah are you okay with spending 350 dollars every four years for an upgraded system I I think so. I mean, they're see. I'm in a different boat where like I I don't necessarily see the I, I don't ha- I can't justify yes. getting an, an X right now. Yeah, I'm a I special case that yeah. like I always you have buy to have it. everything. That's yeah. just my sure. thing. Like sure. it's my hobby tech. I like yeah. to have the newest, latest, best. So yep. um, for everyone, like I always tell people, like if you don't have to have the newest, latest, and greatest. Nothing wrong with Go it. buy a yeah. PS3 or a 360 right now and you get games for like oh, a buck a piece. Man. Yeah. Incredible library. So true. You yeah. know, if you can if you can stay one generation behind, you're in, in a good position. Yeah. But this and this is the thing that I really like about the Xbox One overall, is it's it is very much a great system for enjoying a whole bunch of different games because you not only have the Xbox One software, a whole bunch of 360 games are backwards compatible now yeah. and even the few xbox like original xbox yeah. games so that was a big selling point yeah. for me too i should have mentioned that is you know i have this huge collection of xbox titles i have one system that i can now play the majority of them on like the, the backwards compatibility for 360 yeah. games is pretty extensive and uh xbox games it's a good list uh they can even get that to 50 yeah of they, the best games but they've been be saying the problem they're running into is a lot of licensing issues yeah for they're sure. like sh- like we figured out the technology but like you know a lot of these deals Music. like you get music's a big one yeah um that i think like some of the original like agreements maybe don't even exist anymore because it's like back then you didn't think yeah that you were gonna be dealing with these kind of issues yeah we yeah. should actually fire up some fusion frenzy at lunchtime oh i love fusion frenzy <laughs> <laughs> yes um so i think one thing though is that we don't i don't know how well this is going to do like in terms of sales because it has to be said this is one of the most expensive consoles ever and that was my initial thought yeah this is not going to sell well at all it's sold out everywhere yeah i know they they they, they microsoft is uh I'm touting some stat that it's the most pre-ordered xbox of all time or something that's a little bit deceptive but um i think the numbers are there i think you're gonna see that it's it's gonna sell yeah like a good amount i never thought it would sell this much to be honest right but a lot of people i'm seeing um on online on social media are actually picking it up i thought i would be one like maybe one in 50 that picks it up and it's more like you know one in 20 
hmm. that I'm seeing. Like it's it's maybe not that don't that's not yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Nope, these stats are not based on <laughs> any I'm actual saying, fact. Yeah. All I'm saying is yeah. that it seems like more people are buying it than than I thought it would. Right. Okay. If you look at the value of the system from from the specs sure. that I've seen, apparently that it's possible that Microsoft might even be taking a loss on these. So yeah, it's a five hundred dollar US system, but apparently it's a pretty good deal. Like from what I'm hearing, it's like six hundred and fifty dollars. We're talking US dollars here for the, for the actual tech. Yeah, it's, giving, it's more like yeah. around six hundred and fifty because I know that they've done um, I don't know tests where they've had to yeah. go out and they bought similar components and made a gaming PC. Um, and it's come out to 650 bucks, not huh. 500. So apparently the value yeah, I guess if you is look there. at it that way, yeah, it's still yeah. just justifying a $500 gaming machine. And sure. it all comes down to your priorities, right? Like, you know, um, for me, I don't smoke. I, I have no social life anymore. <laughs> so my, you know, that little your bit of are going to my it. entertainment yeah. money goes sure. towards my Xbox, you yeah. know? So yeah. it's just a matter of how you justify spending your disposable yeah. income. Yeah. Well, I think it's, um, it's interesting, like, who this console is for, because I think if you don't own an Xbox One yet, like, I don't know why you would want to get an S over this one. Like, I feel and like you would want the, the X. The best? Yeah. yeah. It would also, it factors into, do you have a 4K TV? Yeah, you know, yeah, that's a big one. You might be okay with just yeah. the S. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I, I think right now it's for hardcore gamers. Yeah. Like, because if you already own an Xbox One, do you see much reason to upgrade? I Unless say yes. you are. I say yes. Uh, if you have an original Xbox One, definitely. Oh, that's what uh, I have. No, stop. <laughs> I don't want to. Uh. But again, I don't know if I would see. Yeah. So for you, I don't know if I would recommend you get the Xbox One X yeah. or get a cheap Xbox One S. You're going to get uh, some power upgrade. You're going to be able to run things yeah. better than the original Xbox. It's a beautiful, nice white system, which I always liked. Yeah. So like yeah, you're you're kind of that know. person. Like I feel like I'm probably just gonna hang on to my big fat Xbox One until it dies or something like yeah, that. Yeah, or you know, know, wait a year and yeah. the Xbox One X, you might find one used and you know you can. Yeah, that's true. I've seen some decent sales on like the Pro this year, so absolutely. Yeah, and then that might be the time where you sell your old one and get the new one. So. Yeah, um, I actually did an unboxing video on my YouTube channel if you guys want to check it out it's at CJR. Uh, feel free to check that very professional unboxing. <laughs> I'm not, not really. <laughs> uh, moving on to topic three of the day, Star Wars Battlefront 2. Yes. Uh, I've been mentioning this like pretty much every podcast. Uh, I had the chance to go down to uh, Redwood Shores in California. That's actually where EA's headquarters is. That's where Andrew Wilson? I think is the CEO's name. Okay. They showed us, they're like, there's Andrew Wilson's office. This is like EA's main campus. Yeah. There's the guy who um, decided to close the, the visceral, visceral? Games. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, EA. It's, it feels like everything with EA is like kind of one step forward right now. and yeah. two steps back. I mean, uh, they brought me down as part of the Game Changers program, which is a, like a social media influencer program where they invite us into check out new games which is great you know they won the golden poop award i think it's called as the worst company in america two years straight yeah, yeah. and they've done stuff like this to try and get away from that and try and you know garner some more goodwill but then we've got the issue of you know basically them buying studios and you know shutting a lot of them down yeah, it's one of those things now, like, if you're an uh, independent studio, EA comes knocking. It's like, oh, yeah. great, how long are we going to be open for? But Yeah, so uh, Battlefront 2, uh, basically I got two days hands-on with the game. I played the thing to death. I've played through the entire story mode. Um, we actually posted a gameplay preview on Goliath that you can check out. And again, I just posted today, because the embargo went up um, on my YouTube side, a walkthrough of the first three story mode chapters, which are very good. Um, yeah. if you look at this game, so when people, uh, got their hands on the original Battlefront, the complaint was that it was just kind of almost like a shell of a game. Yes. It felt very much like as a platform to sell you future content. Yeah. It but was, yeah, I mean, beautiful game, fantastic gameplay, a really good game, just kind of bare bones. Yeah. It almost felt like it was like a beta for this game to me. Yeah. So yeah, this game, uh, basically I played the story mode. It's it's really good. Um, and if you factor in all the multiplayer content that they're doing, it's basically everything. I'd say it's easily three times the content that was in the first one. It might even be more. 
Yeah, I think they even made a like a trailer or like some kind of uh, feature video where they were actually they had like oh yeah that's right the bar graphs, graphs. Yeah. yeah I saw that being like here's the original one and we have this much more content more characters yeah. more, more locations yeah, yeah exactly more vehicles yeah, yeah so yeah. um the in terms of uh multiplayer mode um I'm not really a great first person shooter guy uh and we got to the event and they're just like. Oh yeah, we're gonna be playing it on PC. I'm like, oh oh, <laughs> like my mouse and keyboard skills are nearly non-existent. Like, do okay. you, have you ever played anything on PC? I I know I feel like I don't a lot, um, yeah. especially mouse and keyboard. I yeah, mean, yeah. If I, do like, I know PC, I don't have to I do use it, my but... controller. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, sure. Uh, that was interesting. So I got yeah. my butt kicked by a lot of uh, you know Twitch streamers who play this game all day and YouTube yeah. stars and. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about that I am super excited to play more of is the uh starfighter assault now we heard during the beta that that was a, a huge huge hit and the fans really loved it and i finally got some hands on with it and man is it fun <laughs> i actually found that i was pretty good at it i'm not great at first person shooters but uh, i could control the ship and apparently good at dog fighting yeah apparently i'm good at well i have been playing crimson skies ah, bit, there so you go. Oh, that may factor in yeah, but yeah. uh criterion handled the starfighter assault yep. section criterion uh, creators of the burnout series and it really shows you can like be flying around super fast your perspective is spinning all over the place and uh yet you still have a sense of where you are in the map and stuff like that so it um the starfighter assault was definitely a highlight for me um the game comes out i think on the, on the 17th yeah, so just over a week. Yeah, yeah, so I'll actually have my review up on Goliath.com the day the embargo ends, which I believe is the 14th, so okay. a few days early. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to finally getting my hands on this one. I haven't really been following it super closely. Just yeah. been, like most games now, I kind of just want to be surprised by them. I think you're um, going to be impressed with this game. Yeah, I mean, I played quite a bit of the original, yeah. and I still liked it despite its flaws. Like, I still found it fun and a lot of it had to do with well the fact that we hadn't had a star wars battlefront game for like a decade before yeah. that and just um i guess like how impressive the technology was oh, like man. it felt like you were really in those like kind of battles definitely and... one of the best looking video games yeah, definitely still, console yeah. games of all yeah. time yeah so um i mean there's a lot of kind of negativity surrounding this game because of the whole you know loot box controversy mm -hmm. I mean, EA came out, like, just the other week saying, like, oh, we've made some changes, like, it's not going to be as bad. They tweaked some some of it. Well, you know, some of the higher items are not available wait and that see, way Wait see, I guess, yeah. like, but, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to both, like, the, the campaign and uh, multiplayer. It'll yeah, be a lot of fun. Yeah. Star Wars Battlefront will be in stores on November 17th. And, uh, like I said, check out the review on Goliath.com. So topic number four on today's podcast is Assassin's Creed Origins. You've had more time with the game and your review is now live on yep, the Com. Review is up. Um, I've yeah, sunk yeah, quite a few hours into this one now. Um, this was a game that just was not on my radar at all. Like I, uh, where do I go back with the Assassin's Creed games? Uh, like I played through uh, Assassin's Creed 2, which, you know, was a, a great game for its time. Yeah. Played through Brotherhood, still like that one. And then I just kind of, like... Did you play Black I Flag? Off. I played some of it. That's one, uh, that's, like, the only one that I actually got into. Right. I mean, yeah, it had the, um, you know, the, the ship combat, all that, the pirate theme. But my problem with that game was that all the kind of, like, Assassin's Creed elements, I feel like, got in the way of it just being a cool pirate game. I'm like, I don't care about this... Okay, yeah, now I have a question story. for you. Okay. Do the Assassin's Creed elements get in the way of this being a cool e game based in, like, Egypt? No, not really. No? Okay. Um, yeah, so, like the title implies, it's, like, Origins. This is, like, before, I think, really, the uh, Assassin's Templar thing, like, really got going. Like, okay. you don't really hear much mention at all of anything having to do with Assassins. Like, um, the whole, like, uh, like modern day stuff is barely in it. Okay, You, you get kicked out, like here and there but it's for like a minute and every just time to be you like, do it you're just like oh yeah i'm kind of like all right shut up get me back in that animus and yeah. let's go back to egypt all right um yeah but like the, the changes they've made are like really impressive like this is definitely one of the best assassin's creed games that's good um because i think you mentioned in your in your review that it was yeah. kind of a franchise that's going a bit stale it was yeah i mean um I think Syndicate doesn't get enough credit. Like, this was the previous one, like, from two years ago. Okay. That was in, um, like, Victorian uh, 
England and yeah. all that. Uh, that game kind of, I guess, fixed some of the problems of uh, Unity, which mm-hmm. was the one that got you know all the criticisms. It was broken. There was it's so many problems with it. Um, but it still felt a little too samey. Like it was you know the same kind of repetitive stuff. This game, like it's still Origins, is still very much an Assassin's Creed game, but it feels like they've taken bits and pieces from other okay. successful open world games over the past few years yep. and tried to just improve things overall. Like the combat kind of feels like a mix of like kind of like Dark Souls and Zelda. Okay. Um, yeah, like it's fun. I still have. I think the combat is one of the. Um, kind of more disappointing aspects of the game. I think it definitely improves on past Assassin's Creed games, which better the combat, combat was never great. But... Better combat in Shadow of War? No, I don't think so. Okay, so then yeah. I, like, I consider that pretty fun combat. So yeah. the Assassin's Creed combat, well, combat should be... I have to you know, I have to give them credit for not just like using that whole like Arkham Asylum yes. style combat yeah. and not <laughs> just being like, I was just throw that in, you yeah. know, because... But at the same time, like, and I mentioned this in my review, like, that is popular for a reason yeah. it's because it's a really good combat system right yeah, a great combo and, system in those yeah, yeah yeah and um i mean this one gets a little better as you get used to it but still i find like i'll be fumbling with the control sometimes being like oh yeah crap what, what do i use the block again like okay. which is weird like well you mentioned this in, many hours in and yeah I'm you still mentioned not in shadow of war that you were kind of overwhelmed a lot of times with, with yeah. enemies is it a similar same thing, same here? thing okay. here um that that is kind of the big problem with the combat is that it's very it's great for one-on-one encounters. Yeah. Because it feels very much um, made for that because you are you have a, a target lock-on. Okay. You know, it's very much based on blocks and, like, parries and that kind of stuff. But as soon as you get swarmed, it just kind of falls off the rails and you're just kind of like, get I'm going to go climb up this yeah. building and not get <laughs> away from you. Say, yeah. um, but it's But um, it's also feels like a little easier to do stealth than it used to be. So you kind of, uh, you know, a lot of these games now you're, you thin out the herd kind of beforehand, and then you kind yes. of take care of the last few guys yeah. with um, standard formula. Yeah. I mean, Far Cry does that. Yeah, um, but other cool stuff with this game, like you, uh, there's like these hidden tombs you can find. Okay. Um, I found one like I was playing through last night, and I'm like, "Whoa, this is cool!" And there was like a like cool like puzzle elements in it, um, and then you find like some awesome loot at the end. So I'm like, "Oh, I need to start like trying to find these." um like treasure rooms more okay so there's uh, like a it's kind of like mario it's compelling to go look for like yeah, secrets yeah. well and it's gone it's gone like full rpg okay cool. um you know you're constantly getting new loot and uh it's you know tiered into different you know classes of loot like the the blue stuff is garbage but like you want the yellow like legendary items and um this is kind of interesting but you can actually level up um your old weapons to like be at your current level so okay. you can hang on you want to like hang on to stuff that you like yes so it's not like a lot of rpgs where you're like oh man i gotta get rid of that yeah. because it's so under leveled now yeah but You've almost it, grown it, attached yeah, to it. yeah. <laughs> it, but it costs a lot of the in-game currency which is actually you know useful for once i always find like i'm not i don't have enough of it yeah yeah now the game is absolutely gorgeous yeah it looks I mean, great on the xbox I, One yeah X. i'm playing it on just a standard ps4 i don't have 4k but like yeah i hear it's just like really jaw dropping on like pc and that kind of thing but actually this would be one i'd be interested to see how it looks on the one x yeah uh um, what about voice acting and stuff like that is it pretty good and yeah actually um they you don't hear like any british accents yeah like it actually feels like authentic i mean everyone's or speaking english French but like accents right yeah in there from <laughs> ubisoft <laughs> no yeah no but that was the thing it was unity was set in um in france but everyone had british accents oh, it's yeah. like what this is from a French company. The one time they could use the French yeah. accent. Because there's been so many just games that like... Just find people around the office yeah. and just do it. would be more authentic. What's Yves Guillemot doing right now? Yeah, They're right? here for a voiceover. Uh, yeah. Um, but, but, um, it's selling really well, apparently. Yes. I, I heard it was something like it's doubled Syndicate's sales or it's selling twice as fast. I don't know. Something and considering like that. the time that it came out, I, that's yeah, pretty I impressive. Really, that doesn't bode well for Wolfenstein, I think, which was yeah. released on the same day. But I... I'm happy to see it selling well, because I think yeah. it actually deserves it. Absolutely. Um, it's a good return to form for this franchise. Um, I gave it an 8 out of 10, but, like, that's a that's a strong 8. Yeah. I find. Like, I couldn't, I wasn't sure about, like, a 9 or 10, because it's, like, at the same time, 
there's a lot of games like this, and I don't think it quite matches up to, like, uh, Breath of the Wild or Horizon Zero Dawn. Yeah, Nine. you don't want to give it too many points for just being a better game than the last one. Right, You know, right. you kind of, like, have that previous history kind yeah. of factoring into your review a little bit. But. Yeah. So, yeah, Assassin's Creed Origins is out now, and you can find next review on Goliath.com. Topic number five for the day is the closure of VR Studio CCP Productions. Yeah, uh, so... Creators of what? Elite Elite Dangerous, right? No, um, I, I, we, I know we keep getting this messed up. Eve Valkyrie. Uh, Eve Valkyrie, That's yep. the one. Yep, so, yeah, apparently they're kind of shutting down their VR division. Um, this is going to affect about a thousand employees, um, but it sounds like a lot of them are being moved to different positions, so... It doesn't sound like there's going to be like a ton of job losses. Which okay, is so good. not necessarily a closure. It's just more like a shift in a shift focus. Shift in focus. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I think, like we were talking about this, this is what what does this mean for VR? Because yeah. these were kind of this is one of the big developers that were behind uh, VR in, in a big way. Absolutely. And clearly, they're not getting the. Um, I guess maybe, probably like results that they yeah return maybe on their yeah. investment. Well, I don't want to look too much into like one studio flipping over and and just no. saying like we're not doing VR. But I mean, it is. I mean, it could be an issue of whether that company um, just simply kind of overshot their expectations of of return on on a game. Yeah. Uh, the attachment rate. I mean, I, I can't remember the numbers, but I think there's only something like a couple million. VR headsets out in, the, in wild. the wild. Yeah. So yeah. if you think about that, if you get yeah, like your a game's not going to be selling millions of copies, you yeah. would need a fifty percent attachment rate to sell so, yeah. a million copies, right? Yeah. So it's tough at this point, and, and uh, it, it leads into the conversation that we've mentioned before of the chicken and the egg of um, basically to buy a headset you need the software to be out there in order to entice you to buy it. Right. And for the software to be made, there has to be enough headsets out there for the companies to want to make software for exactly. it. So it's yep. kind of cyclical. And the problem with VR is at this point, the headsets are pretty expensive, which is a deterrent from uh, yeah. people actually buying them. Yeah. It's, it's tough all around um, in the industry right now. I mean, just because like everything is just so splintered off into so many different like, categories yeah. um you know if if developers and publishers are having a hard time selling games on consoles that are like you know they've sell, sold tens of millions of units you know what like i guess impetus is there to make a vr game or to invest resources in a vr game where you're going to sell a fraction well it's hard you might less games are being made it's it's the triple A games that that companies okay, are yeah, less games at a certain level. I think I think there's like more games than ever right now. Like the but, marketplace is just flooded. Yeah, so there's like two yeah. tiers is my point, right? Okay. So there's the triple A full price game. Yeah. And then there's the indie stuff and in some category VR stuff. So if if companies are going to make VR games, they're going to be the you know ten to twenty dollar range, uh, just kind of cool unique experiences like job. Sure. Have you seen Job Simulator? Have you ever played it? Um, yeah, a little bit. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That's like, I think that's like 25, 30 bucks. So, yeah. um, where you won't see is, you know, companies investing all that time into VR, uh, for a triple A game, yeah. which thus might not entice people to buy the headsets. Right. Because you want stuff that or like software that really feels like a killer app and yeah. feel, and we really haven't seen that on vr yet i mean there's, there's some couple... games that very much like are must play experiences but... yeah the problem like i said is the the price barrier and i mean it is getting better we saw yes. a deep deep discount on the oculus rift yeah um during the summer and i'm, I'm sure it's at that price now so it, instead of like the thousand dollar range you're looking at the yeah you know six hundred dollar range yeah. which is starting to get there for, yeah. for for some people i think the problem was that you know everyone kind of thought there was this kind of vr gold rush and it's just not going as quickly as people thought. Like it's really disappointing to me because the the tech is there. Yeah, the VR headset. It's getting experience, better all the time. Yeah, I put on. I put, I own an HTC Vive. I put that on for the first time, and I was in shock at how good it was. Yeah, and how immersive it was. Yeah. Well, I think this kind of ties into the problem with it is that it's no doubt that it's impressive, and every everyone that tries it is like blown away by it. But it's like. How much do you want to keep doing? Like, how much do you use your Vive? Yeah, uh, right? not very often. Yeah. That's, that's and, you're totally right. And that seems to be, and like, happening a lot. It's, like, where people still want to just kind of 
sit on the couch and just play a yeah. regular game. Part like, of that is the technology. Uh, yeah, you know, there's some cords. It's, cords and it's yeah. not. It's not really yeah. an issue, but I mean, it's just one more deterrent. So I guess my final question to sum up the VR topic is: Did the push for VR just kind of happen like five years too early? Um, maybe because I still don't feel like that you know compelling sense that I need a VR headset. Like, if you yep. could get one for 200 bucks, you would probably consider it, right? Yeah, I'd consider it. Yeah. Um, and you could hook it up to, like, your Xbox. Or at, the, at this point, you know, five years from that point, the Xbox One X is now out and is probably powerful enough to run some, some, some sort of right. VR headset. I think it's kind of a missed opportunity, actually, for Microsoft to not have uh, launched the One X with a VR headset. That's a very good point. Yeah, like, I fully expected that they were going to do some kind of maybe, like, a Oculus partnership. Yeah, they like, have hey, some special... sort of partnership already, as far as I know. There's yeah, I mean, going there's going to there. be some sort of like VR um, component to it, but the thing, it just feels weird to like launch this console that's very much capable of putting out like like a very good VR. Yeah, like you know, I think like up there with like the you know H HTC Vive and that sort of stuff. Like, and not have that be front and center. So yeah, know. we don't want to read too much into no, you know one so studio early. just kind of shifting focus. I think yeah. that's what they said. Yeah, I, I just think it's like this doesn't mean VR is dead by any stretch of the imagination. I think it's just gonna take some time. Yeah, like even CCP, they've said like we still firmly believe in VR. It's just in the short term, we're just shift you know we're shifting our focus. They need somewhere to make else. some money. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It's like well, there's just not a lot of money in right now, but as um you know more headsets get sold the technology catches on i yeah i think there'll be plenty of opportunity yeah so hopefully vr is not going anywhere because i think it's a fantastic tech moving on to topic six on the day uh telltale uh, some job cuts at telltale the studio that produces the what would you call them like uh story based like point kind of click? adventure games. yeah adventure yeah, games, yeah you get uh, walking dead wolf among us all that sort of tales stuff. of the borderlands batman yeah, uh, is the latest one guardians of the galaxy oh, man there's so many now yeah it started off with uh back to the future i believe yeah i think yeah. that was the first one yeah not not very well critically received i think they really started hitting their stride yeah, at it. at uh uh, Walking, Walking Dead, Dead. The, yeah, Walking Dead one. was like the game of the year or something when that came out. It was, it was really 2012. good. 2012. Um, yeah, so they've um, laid off 25% of their workforce, so that's about 90 employees af affected. Um, they said that the decision is to make the company, quote, more competitive as a developer and publisher of groundbreaking story-driven game experiences with an emphasis on high quality in the years ahead. So maybe they've just kind of expanded a little bit too much and they're trying to tighten yeah, things up. Yeah, it sounds like, well, what they're saying is they're focusing on delivering fewer, better games with a smaller team. Okay. So maybe they figured, uh, they've they kind of stressed themselves too thin. I think we've seen, like, too many Telltale games. Technical issues also. There's a lot of technical issues in there. Yeah, games. yeah. Feels bad to say, but I mean, like, with a team that big, I still can't believe that they don't have, like, a great engine, but... Yeah, and I mean, the games aren't really that taxing. You'd think no. that they would have fixed that by now. So that was always an issue with the Telltale games. Do you think that they, they should... How much should we read into this? We talked about the VR topic. Is is uh, Are the uh, Telltale games kind of tailing off in their popularity? Um, I I don't know, because they, never, they didn't really say anything about, like, uh, if it had to do with sales. I mean, they just said that, you know, the industry is shifting and we have to kind of adjust to that. It sounds like they'll still be making the same type of games, but it sounds like they want to kind of double down on making better quality games. Yeah, maybe they're less... realizing that people are like getting kind of sick of that formula. So yeah. maybe there's going to be some like big changes. And which you can't really fault them for, you know, no. sometimes less is more. If you can focus more on one project instead of having a whole bunch going on at once, yeah. it's a better way to do it. I think it's just, I'm just sick of hearing about all these layoffs. You know, like studio closures. There was also what uh, Runic Games. Oh yeah, that's in the past right. week or so, like these are the guys who did um, the Torchlight, Torchlight games. Did you ever are... play those? Um, I I didn't, but kind of I, Diablo -like I heard. Diablo-like. Yeah, games. I heard they were great. Really like, good they games. Were, yeah. like, up, um, actually, I think the original Torchlight was like seen as like a better alternative to Diablo three back when it launched because you know back when Diablo three launched, like it kind of sucked. Yeah. Yeah. So like <laughs> when I hear this, the first thing yeah. I think of is why the heck didn't they put Torchlight one and two on the Switch? 
And like, yeah. there's just some easy money. God, yeah. 20 bucks. People would have ate that up on the I Nintendo don't know. I, I think that's tough to say. I don't know if are, it would have been saving are, are, are for the company. Are you saying but... with the Telltale games as well? Yeah, Telltale. Yeah. Also, why aren't these games on the Switch? Like, yeah. strike while the iron's hot. People yeah, want but content. You gotta realize Get them that, on there. But like, you know, porting takes resources. It takes time. Not everyone, you know can react that quickly to like this no one knew that the switch was gonna you right. do this well that's true and it's only been like seen, six months yeah, at the most we've seen some really developers kind of um jump on board jump on board like i think uh what was it the was it that ocean horn game yeah um, a mobile apparently, game that... apparently that the switch version is their best selling like by a huge margin and it's just like, like holy crap we being at the realize. right place at the right yeah. time I, I was even like my my point was at launch on the switch where bomberman launched it sold like gangbusters and it wasn't a very good game and it was full priced yeah just because there was a lot there wasn't of a lot of stuff at the time yeah. i mean now the store is catching up and there's a lot of stuff yeah. in there but uh, i just feel like you know i would love to play some torchlight on the nintendo switch and maybe that could have kept them open a little bit longer but yeah. like you said good point it's... like it's it was kind of a. It kind of happened all of a sudden with the popularity yeah. of the Switch. And... It's it's a volatile time right now. Yeah, absolutely. everyone's trying to get on like this shift to these games that can are like games as service. And yeah, can kind of keep selling you stuff. Like the whole thing with Runic Games was that they they had just released a game called Hob, mm -hmm. which I think was. Uh, like twenty dollars sort of indie game. Yeah, uh, I have to look this one up. Yeah, like, I don't know much about it, but I've heard, I I've heard great Nidhogg. things. Nidhog, I keep. Oh, okay. Out. Yeah, but um, it got great reviews, but I think it just did not sell. And again, maybe a case of not meeting, maybe too lofty expectations. And yeah, I don't know. Um, but yeah, right now, but I think it's a good sign that we're still seeing a game like Assassin's Creed Origins apparently selling really well. Because yeah. it does, it kind of disproves EA's whole thing with shutting down uh, Visceral, being like, ah, people don't really want these uh, AAA story-driven single-player yeah. games anymore. It's like, well, they want still... loot boxes. Yeah, they want loot boxes <laughs> all the time. All the loot boxes. Um, speaking of which, have you seen the stuff with Call of Duty World War Two? I haven't. Um, apparently, there's something in it where you, like, when you open loot boxes, it's like in front of everyone else too. So it's like, hey, look at the stuff oh, I got. Oh, I did hear about yeah. that. So uh, they're like trying to entice people by watching. Oh, I think yeah. you get credit for watching people yeah, unbox yeah. loot boxes. Like, <laughs> so you're they're uh, trying to entice people into essentially gambling on these loot boxes yeah. and giving them incentive to watch other people open theirs. That's pretty. That's a that's through a, the looking glass here, people. <laughs> And uh, that's that's an interesting tactic. Anyway, that was a odd place to go for a rant, but no. That's anyway, okay. yeah, I you know I I just. To sum up, I just hope, you know, everyone affected by these layoffs at Telltale, you know, lands on their feet, find yeah. a job somewhere else in the industry. All right. So that's all the time we have for this episode. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for the Goliath Gamecast. Nick, any parting words? Well, just wanted to say thanks for joining us for our first uh, video Gamecast. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. I hope, you know, it wasn't too excruciating. <laughs> um, and anyone listening on audio, uh, hey, check out the video. You missed us on camera yeah Woo! you missed the shots of the game room yeah here. feel free to come check those out you can find the video <laughs> on facebook or the goliath youtube page yeah um i guess do you have anything else you want to um yeah i guess just i'll just plug my social media uh follow me on twitter and instagram at nick underscore steinberg and of course you can keep up with my writing on goliath.com and same with me. You can find some of my writing and videos on Goliath.com. And you can follow me anywhere on social media at C-J-R-S-E-E-J-A-Y-A-R-E. -E -E. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.